Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you and uh, welcome you to my practice and considering having a breast reduction. Uh, all you probably have already filled out this purple sheet which has a list of risk and benefits on it, but I'm, I'm going to go over that myself. Many of you have watched or will watch a video about the procedure, so we're going to try to hit this on multiple fronts in different ways because people learn differently. Okay. First of all, what happens with the breast reduction? Actually, let me back up. 98% of women who have breast reductions are happy they've had the surgery. It has the highest patient satisfaction rate of any surgery we do. It does not mean there aren't complications. And I mention that because most of the time we talk about some of the bad things that could happen with surgery. And if that's all you hear, it's troublesome. So just keep in the back of your mind that this has the highest patient satisfaction rate of any surgery we do. We sometimes get comments like, I should have done this 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Okay. Oftentimes patients will tell me in the recovery room, I could already feel a difference. I can lay on my back and I don't have all that pressure on my chest. Or when I see them a week after surgery, oh, I can tell within a few days or sometimes on a car ride home that my back feels better. So that's the reason we do this surgery, okay? So what happens with the surgery? Well, the obvious thing, the breasts are made smaller. That's what a breast reduction is. But with that, you also get a lifting procedure. So you have a lifting of the breast. Now, what I can't tell you is, will the breast start to settle six months after surgery or six years after surgery? Everyone is different. They will start to settle again at some point. If something happens, for example, pregnancy being a common example, that causes the breast to get larger and then they get smaller again, weight changes can do the same thing, that will cause the breast to settle sooner, just like if you didn't have a breast reduction. Okay. So we mentioned some of the good things. Breasts are smaller, breasts are gonna be lifted. What's the price to pay for that? For you, the cost is gonna be that you're gonna have scars on your breast. There's a 100% chance of having scars. The scars are gonna go around the nipple. It's gonna come down and go side to side. It's gonna look like an anchor or an upside down T. The areolas are also made smaller when you have a breast reduction. Okay. Now, um, if you look at your breast closely, you'll see there's gonna be some difference. One is usually bigger, one nipple might be higher, more towards the side, larger. There's always variation. That's what we would call asymmetry. When I do the surgery, I'm gonna to try to make you perfect and correct all those asymmetries. However, I fail 100% of the time. I will not make you perfect, okay? You'll always have some differences between your breasts. Everybody has differences beforehand. You'll still have some differences afterwards. We would like for those differences to be less noticeable. Big differences in, in the breast, either uh, being a cup size too big on one side, uh, nipple being two or three inches higher or lower on one side, differences in the shape of the nipple, Okay, those things are less common. Okay, big differences can happen, but they're pretty uncommon. Small differences, differences in the shape of the nipple, which I misspoke before, that's common. You know, small differences in the position, very, very common. Small differences in the breast size, but a cup size, two cup size difference is not what you would typically expect. Okay, now other things that happen with the surgery are typically related to blood supply. Okay. And the most common area we see it is at the T-junction. That's where this up and down incision meets the side to side incision. And about 20% of the time you can have some slow or delayed wound healing there. Okay? And this can happen anywhere along the incision, but that's a common area. You can sometimes have some blistering where you may lose the pigmented portion of the skin. Typically that heals without a problem, although at times you can heal and the pigment comes back darker or it comes back lighter or not at all and it heals pink. Um, you can also have where you develop a little bit of a scab. That scab peels off. It might take a week or two for it to come off. Um, the scab leaves a little shallow ulcer. It may take a couple weeks or more for it to heal. Sometimes that scab can be pretty deep. It may take a month for it to come off and it may take several months for it to heal. Okay. At times, the skin can do perfectly well and you can have internal areas that develop firmness, either from scar tissue or from parts of the uh, breast or the fatty tissue that loses blood supply and get what's called fatty necrosis. It can leave a firm area, sometimes tender in the breast, and that may need to be addressed down the road. Okay. Um, we, had, we had talked about that the trade-off, okay, the cost to pay is you're going to have scars. And I'd say 95% of patients are accepting of their scars. Okay. Those who are not, it's usually one of three common reasons. Okay. The scar can spread and become wider. The scar can become taller or thicker, like a keloid, or the scar can stick out. And that's usually along the incision that goes from side to side, and the most common area is on the outside. Sometimes on the inside, but it's more common on the outside. That's what we call a dog ear. Those may be treated with a variety of methods, including uh, steroid injections or scar fading creams, or sometimes require surgery. 
Now, the risk of needing a revisional surgery is about 1% to 2%. And if you need revisional surgery because the breasts are still too big or you feel like the breasts are too small or they're not as equal as you would like them to be, you don't like the quality of scars, those revisional procedures may not be covered by insurance and therefore would be an out-of-pocket expense. And again, the revision rate is about 1% to 2%. Okay. Other things that can happen with surgery, uh, with any surgery for that matter, risk of bleeding about 1% to 2%, okay. risk of infection about 1% to 2%. Typically, infection can be treated with antibiotics, sometimes require surgery. Bleeding may require uh, surgery. Small amount of bruising, that's fine. That happens all the time. Okay? Now, after surgery, it's common to have numbness in the breast. You usually go from numbness to developing sometimes oversensitivity as the nerves start to wake up. Sometimes you'll get a shooting or burning type pain, just like if your arm falls asleep and you bump it and that happens about three to four weeks off from the procedure. Most patients, the numbness gets better. Most patients, the oversensitivity gets better, but not everyone. So there are some patients who remain either completely numb or the numbness has improved, but not completely. And there are some patients who remain oversensitive after surgery. What the surgery does not do is it does not take care of any fullness that you have on the side. So when the breast becomes smaller, the fullness that you have on the side will look larger just by proportion. And if any fullness you have in your tummy, that might look larger to you as well. So if you have fullness on the side, we may have to talk about ways to treat that. And that can range from liposuction. It could perhaps mean doing an upper body lift, but there are ways typically to treat it. And we'll discuss that on a case by case basis. The downside to those procedures is they're considered cosmetic. So that's not covered by part of your insurance. Um, other things that we talked about is poor wound healing and uh, one thing that's not very common okay it happens about one tenth of the percent but is a big deal if it happens is, is having blood supply issues with the nipple now a little bit of blistering usually heals without a problem you can have the pigment problems we talked about either not coming back coming back darker you can have little scabs that develop again small areas usually heal without a problem but the extreme case is the whole nipple can turn dark just like a baby's belly button turns dark and then falls off. Now that's a big deal because you're left without a nipple. And a uh, nipple that doesn't have feeling and doesn't have the ability to breastfeed, which we'll get into in a little bit. So the chance of that happening is quoted about one tenth of one percent. It's more common in people who are smokers, people who use nicotine, um, patients who are overweight, and patients who need larger breast reductions. Now some patients, the breasts are so large and the distance of the nipple from the blood supply is so long that we do what's called a free nipple graft procedure. The majority of patients don't need this, so I will talk about that with uh, patients on a case-by-case -case situation. Okay, Other things to consider with um, surgery. Um, uh, younger patients who either haven't had pregnancy or are still of childbearing age may want to breastfeed. And what the literature shows is about 80% of women can still produce milk through the nipple, and 80% of those women can produce enough milk to nourish the baby. So when you do the math, 64% of women can successfully breastfeed, and slightly more than one third cannot breastfeed after breast reduction surgery. Um, the chance of needing another breast reduction is pretty small. It does happen from time to time, but that's not a common uh, problem. It's probably a little more common in somebody who hasn't had pregnancy and still younger patients. We've seen patients 12 and 13 years old who need breast reduction.